Um, so, oh great, lights. Um, so, today I'm going to talk to you about chinoiserie and japonisme. I put a cover image here. If these terms are unfamiliar to you, um, my first couple slides are not going to be helpful to you, so I thought here at the introduction I would just say this is a really good example of chinoiserie of the 18th century. It's a fireplace surround at Clayton House in Buckinghamshire in England. Um, and it has a, a, a nice kind of exuberant Rococo sort of frame and you've got all these kind of icicles and shells and flowers coming off it, a um, head uh, thought to be re representing someone from Asia carved uh, quite beautifully into the surround, juxtaposed with an actual piece of Japanese porcelain um, exported to Britain probably sometime in the 18th century, and then a Chinese figure probably added at Clayton sometime in the 19th century. So it's this sort of light, exuberant, playful um, kind of style that people most associate with European chinoiserie. So this is the sort of standard thing that would come to mind when, uh, when you think of chinoiserie. Uh, so today I'm going to show you some of that and I'm going to kind of complicate that as well. So I promise I won't read the whole time, but I've got a good quote here. So um, in 1756, John Sheber, who was a London physician and Tory pamphleteer, described the depths to which he thought English, contemporary English taste had apparently sunk. He observed, quote, the simple and sublime have lost all influence almost everywhere. All is Chinese or Gothic. Every chair in an apartment, the frames of glasses and tables must be Chinese. The walls covered with Chinese paper, filled with figures which resemble nothing of God's creation, and which a prudent nation would prohibit for the sake of pregnant women. <laughs> so, um, the rhetoric was heated. Um, Schieber's critique took chinoiserie or what they called the Chinese taste, to be indicative of the moral, economic, and even physical decline of the British nation, pursued through the excessive consumption of excessive objects. By the mid-1750s, such complaints about the fashion for the so-called Chinese taste, uh, now known as chin chinoiserie, were common. Um, so here I'm showing you um, the first plate of Mariage à la Mode. You can see I've put a number that refers to your slide list there on the screen if, if you like captions. I was told to make the images really big, so I decided to not put text on the screen. Um, so here we see in the, uh, the second plate of um, Hogarth's famous series, Mariage à la Mode, um, two um, horrible people <laughs> who have recently married a kind of bankrupt aristocrat and his nouveau riche merchant's daughter bride. And um, all sorts of things that we don't have time to talk about are going on in this image. But what's notable is that they're recovering from their kind of separate evenings of carousing, um, racking up money. Here we have the accountant with, who's holding a book that says ledger, kind of throwing his hand up in disgust. And they're sitting beneath a mantelpiece set with um, Hogarth's kind of parody of Chinese uh, porcelain figures, so-called chinoiserie. And here's the detail of it, so you can see in there these little, uh, sort of a parody of kind of Dewa porcelain figures, sort of gigaws, um, sort of staring at, out at the figures. Um, so here I think we, uh, along with Schieber's um, quote, we get a sense of kind of what the feeling about chinoiserie was by the mid-1750s in Britain as in elsewhere. But for all of its detractors, objects and decorative uh, schemes in the Chinese taste, like that uh, first uh, ch chimney piece surround that I showed you, uh, were a crucial component of polite, fashionable taste uh, in the burgeoning consumer society of mid-18th century Britain. Not merely an aspect or a reflection of that culture, chinoiserie, I think, actually visualized and materialized cultural debates about the relative merits of consumer society through specific aesthetic gestures that allowed a wide range of makers and consumers to negotiate their relationship to a modern commercial world. <laughs> 
Um, so I've just summarized my book for you. That is the, the topic of my book um, that came out in 2014. Um, and I argue there um, that Shinwatsuri was very much a kind of critical style that was um, engaging with consumer culture. So um, if that um, argument appeals to you, um, I direct you to my book. Um, but today, I'm going to um, talk a little bit uh, more broadly, at least geographically. Um, so. If we were to define chinoiserie, we'd say it's a decorative style that takes subject matter, takes its subject matter, its form, and its decoration, um, its images, its ideas, and materials that were thought to be related in some way to China, um, which was understood as both a specific place and as a kind of set of ideas. Uh, the, the style of chinoiserie emerged in the context of early modern global trade and was rec a recognizable design phenomenon across the world by the early 17th century. And while it continues to be produced today, chinoiserie has really never gone out of fashion. It's a style principally developed in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, older scholarship on chinoiseries rather narrowly defined it as a subset of the 18th century European Rococo style, but more recent scholars, including me, have argued that from the earliest iterations, chinoiserie was a global style um, that was produced not out of a one-sided European ignorance of actual Chinese designs and culture, but was produced collaboratively by designers, craftsmen, and merchants in places all across the world that included China. Uh, that interacted by way of transnational trade networks. So here I'm just showing you one um, map um, that gives you a sense of what those trade networks were. We can see we're really looking at um, a kind of globally connected world where you have um, silver um, and raw materials from uh, Latin America going both east through Manila um, to China uh, as well as uh, to the West, we see um, Africa and India um, and its coasts well connected, a world uh, with a lot of exchange, um, perhaps earlier than um, we tend to think of it. And I know you guys have been um, hearing um, lectures uh, dealing with this, so I won't go on too much more. But I just want to point out um, that we can see this even locally here um, in San Francisco. So in 1781, um, the uh, missionary Pedro Cambon um, spent two years traveling from California um, to Manila and to China where he went shopping. Uh, he bought silk vestments and silver liturgical objects and he bought porcelain. And he brought that back to California and you can still see some of it today. This is the holy water um, font at Mission Dolores um, in San Francisco. A, um, 18th century Chinese export um, piece of porcelain. So um, California is part of this global story in the 18th century, and um, we see uh, connections not just between Europe and China in this period, but really global connections that included uh, places that seemed quite peripheral in the 18th century, um, but, um, but were very much connected to these networks. So perhaps Cambon, we can imagine, um, visited a place like this. This is a, um, a fan, probably um, painted in the Netherlands, which is imagining a Chinese warehouse full of lacquer and porcelain, red stoneware, screens, paintings, and I think curiously and quite interestingly, imagines um, the consumers of this shop to be um, Indian uh, Mughal princes. So um, we see here a Dutch image of a Chinese shop depicting Indian consumers. Um, I'm quite sure that um, Chinese workshops and uh, factories did not look like this. Um, but it's a, a kind of imagine, a European kind of imagination of the abundance of um, these types of objects that were regularly exported uh, by the middle of the 17th century to Europe, but also to large parts of um, Asia, to the Swahili coast in Africa, and to the Americas as well. 
So to me, the story of chinoiserie really starts in China in around the um, 1620s or so. I'm showing you here um, a, a rather modest um, basin or bowl. Uh, made at Jingdezhen, the great porcelain factory in China, um, probably between 1620 and 1644. Uh, a good example of the uh, blue and white porcelain that was being uh, produced in this period, both for domestic um, and for um, uh, domestic use and for export. And you can see, some of you are probably quite familiar with this story, by the early 17th century in China, we see a kind of explosion of a popular narrative subject matter in ceramics. You're starting to see illustrations uh, often taken from woodblock prints, kind of explosion of uh, print culture uh, in China in this period. And here you see um, an illustration from the Song Dynasty poem, Rhapsody on Red Cliff with excerpts from the poem also written on the sides. Um, so these types of um, popular illustrative stories were, um, were being produced regularly in China in this period, and they were also the types of ceramics that were being exported uh, to um, Persia and to Europe and to the Americas. Oops, excuse me. So here in uh, the 17th century French painter Jacques Linard's um, still life depicting um, the, what is it, the, the uh, senses and something else. Sorry, I lost my place here. You guys can read it. Oh, it's the five senses and the four elements, right? So um, it's a, a kind of a still life, 17th century still life painting, which you probably noticed, you see that exact same bowl, right? Um, so we know that that particular bowl, produced in large numbers, made its way to Europe by the 17th century. And it was these types of images um, that Europeans were looking at to try to understand um, China and um, who its peoples were, what did it look like, what does its culture stand for. Of course, almost nobody could um, read uh, the poem that was printed on or painted on um, on the surface of the bowl, but they could look at those pictures and they started imagining Chinese people and Chinese culture as diminutive and pleasure seeking and um, a kind of leisured and elegant and kind of cultured people. Um, so these ideas could be met with a lot of admiration. They were also met with a lot of kind of um, cynicism as well. We see um, both responses were possible. Um, but it's these types of images that I think when Europeans start to try to depict China and uh, what they think it looks like, this is what they're looking at. They're actually looking at Chinese images uh, made for a kind of different um, consumer culture. Uh, but, uh, for audiences who would have understood what they were looking at. It's taken up in Europe um, by uh, people who don't really understand what they're looking at and, and um, kind of interpret it differently. And I think the profusion of Chinese um, symbols and iconography and ornaments that, um, that start to uh, be distributed via those trade networks that I showed you the map of, um, get taken up in really kind of interesting ways in a lot of different contexts. So here I'm showing you a Peruvian tapestry woven in the Andes in, um, in the early 18th century. It's um, wool, but it also has some Chinese silk and it also has cotton in it. And let's look at a detail of the center here. And you can see that, um, that these Peruvian weavers are um, well versed in Chinese iconography. So you see here a, a deer, uh, often associated um, in the Taoist tradition with like longevity or good fortune. Here you see a winged phoenix, um, specifically kind of Chinese uh, motifs. We see um, uh, there's some other like a, a 
Quillen and, um, of course, chrysanthemum and peony and um, those kinds of iconography. So and we see here Peruvian weavers interpreting Chinese iconography, not because they know what the symbolism is um, or, try, or trying to put them together in kind of clever ways to communicate particular meanings, as we would see in China, but as um, decorative elements that communicate something of the kind of worldliness of um, Peru at this point, and particularly the new Spanish colonizers um, and uh, Portuguese colonizers of Peru. Um, so we're seeing really a kind of a global image here. Um, does anybody see anything that kind of um, seems unusual or stands out within that? I heard someone say the lion, right? So you're absolutely right. Um, so right here, we see a crowned lion. He's repeated elsewhere. You see him here. There he is again. There, kind of frolicking amongst the deer and these other kind of mythical beasts. Um, and he is um, associated with a lot of different European heraldry. And in lots of European traditions, you'll see a crowned lion. Um, in this context, um, it probably relates to the lion of the kingdom of Castile and Leon, uh, which was uh, in Spain, which was uh, deeply involved uh, with uh, Peru at this moment. We also see elsewhere the displayed eagle of the Holy Roman Empire. Right. So we have these um, kind of intermingling iconographies, um, European and Chinese iconography reinterpreted in a, um, in a Latin American context. And so this to me is also chinoiserie, right? Um, these are also um, people looking at and engaging with Chinese iconography, Chinese materials in the form of the silk. Um, and um, reinterpreting it in a new, in this case, colonial context. Okay. Oh, sorry, there's a, there's a seven on his uh, belly button, which has, has migrated quite strangely. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> that seven is, an, is a an addition. <laughs> so um, this particular um, work might be familiar to you. It's on display in the Osher Gallery at um, the Asian Art Museum. Um, and um, these types of figures um, made in Dewa um, in the 17th and 18th century of um, uh, religious, uh, Buddhist religious uh, figures were another type of um, object and image that would have circulated to places like Peru and to um, London and to Holland um, in this period. And they also, I think, were um, images that had a particular um, meaning um, in a Chinese context. Here we're looking, it's um, the Bodhisattva or um, uh, Budai Hesheng. And um, we see here that um, uh, he's on this beautiful stand. I love that. And um, he's a kind of remarkable figure, right? And so when, particularly when Europeans encountered uh, these types of figures um, as they came on ships and traveled over land um, in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, they didn't quite know what to make of them, but they were kind of compelled by them nonetheless. And so we see um, it's these types of figures I think get reinterpreted um, in European chinoiserie. Here I'm showing you um, a so-called um, Mago, it's actually a perfume burner um, in uh, the, uh, the figure that the French called a Mago. Um, in English called a pagod, um, that was supposed to refer to um, a kind of Chinese religious figure. But again, taking this, um, this sense of kind of whimsy, play, a, a diminutiveness, a kind of outlandishness that came to be associated with Chinese culture um, in Europe. Um, that, I, mean, I think it's hard for us to look at these images now and not kind of read them in kind of racial terms as well. Um, and, and, you know, I think he'd be free to be offended um, by these kinds of images. Um, but in the 18th century, there was less of that, um, uh, that hierarchy of races that comes later in the 19th century. And they were understood more as um, 
uh, kind of images of and examples of sort of whimsy, freedom, and even creativity. So I'm going to show you a lot of examples, particularly in Euro European chinoiserie, of um, artists and consumers using um, chinoiserie as a kind of opportunity for um, aesthetic creativity. Okay, so um, we also see um, Europe is sending its own images to China via those trade networks um, to be sent back to them in the form of um, Chinese materials. So here you see a um, French print of a group of mus musicians which uh, had to have gone to China at some point because we see um, there's actually quite a number of surviving examples of this plate um, that takes the same composition um, and uh, figures, reinterprets them as Chinese figures in European costume playing European instruments. So uh, another kind of nice example of this um, blending um, of uh, chinoiserie that, um, the, where we can see kind of two cultures meeting uh, and the result is this kind of material object that comes down to us today. And we see really um, more than any other material, it's blue and white porcelain, which seems to signify China globally. So um, uh, blue and white porcelain developed initially from um, Persian cobalt until um, the stores of cobalt were found um, in China. So itself a kind of... Um, cross-cultural object from the beginning uh, made mainly to satisfy Islamic tastes uh, for ceramics and uh, kind of later becomes popular um, in China itself. Um, it's blue and white, which uh, because I think um, was able to kind of contain so much iconography, so many scenes and images um, that seemed both compelling and um, kind of mysterious to foreigners, uh, but also could communicate if specific meanings um, to um, Chinese audiences as well. Um, it's uh, that material which uh, really uh, more than any other um, durable good um, really kind of um, signifies China uh, to people. So we see here um, uh, Delftware uh, taking up direct copies of this um, densely ornamented imagery where you see a kind of central image in, this, in, uh, uh, in the center and then these paneled um, symbols around the side. Um, this type of ware became known as crack ware um, in the Netherlands because it came on Portuguese carracks. Um, so it was, it was literally sort of boat ware, right? Um, so here we see a Dutch interpretation of Chinese porcelain made in um, tin glazed stoneware because um, they don't have porcelain technology yet. We see um, in uh, Persia, and uh, places around it a, um, a tremendous engagement with uh, blue and white porcelain and attempts to um, emulate uh, both its materials and its styles. So here we see um, a Persian example, and we see it in Latin America as well at Pueblo de Los Angeles, um, a, another kind of engagement or interpretation of uh, blue and white Porcelain. So we see blue and white porcelain as this kind of um, global material. Uh, I think I referred you in your study guide to Stacy Pearson's uh, wonderful book um, on uh, blue and white porcelain um, in, of the Ming Dynasty as a kind of global commodity. Okay, so by 1708 or so, um, a alchemist who was imprisoned by Augustus the Strong of Staxony um, realizes that he's never going to get free if he has to figure out how to transmute base metals into gold. Um, so he embarks on a different project. Uh, knowing um, the Saxon prince to be a, a wildly enthusiastic collector of both Chinese and Japanese porcelain, um, he begins, he figures out that perhaps he could 
could uh, turn his technical skills to trying to figure out how to make porcelain, which uh, at that point, both the recipe and the technology were unknown in Europe. Uh, however, we have Jesuit uh, missionaries who are beginning to write letters, uh, they, who go to Jingdezhen, uh, look at what they see and describe in a lot of detail what they're looking at. Um, and um, the uh, German alchemist, Johann Friedrich Bocher, um, is reading those letters, um, doing experiments of his own, and by 1708 um, has produced a, um, a version of, um, of red porcelain, um, high-fired stoneware. And, uh, quickly after that figures out um, both the materials and the kiln technology to, um, to fire um, at very, very high temperatures and is able to make um, true or what they called hard paste uh, porcelain. So by 1708, 1709, we see uh, the European uh, manufacture of porcelain at Meissen, um, there's stories of industrial espionage and all sorts of things. The, the recipe quickly uh, gets taken up in Vienna and then in Italy and, um, and uh, then in other places which I've listed on the study guide uh, across Europe. Um, so that by the middle of the 18th century, almost every European country has its own porcelain factory. So that gives you a sense, I think, of the, um, the volume of porcelain that was uh, being imported into China in this period uh, and the importance that Europeans placed on trying to um, create an import substitution, create um, their, their own material so that they wouldn't be ha having to buy so much um, from abroad. Um, so Meissen is making objects like this. And here I think it's when we really kind of start to see some of the use of chinoiserie, um, where Meissen is explicitly, uh, the whole point of Meissen is to replace Chinese porcelain, right? To make a European um, equivalent to high quality Chinese porcelain. And so one way in which they do that is by copying um, the kind of bright colors of Qing Dynasty um, porcelain, um, putting in their own images of, kind of chinoiserie figures, their own interpretation of those Chinese literary and religious scenes that they saw on export wear. Um, so here we see that sort of painting. And it seems to me that the message of this is very much that it's authentic, right? So often, I think chinoiserie is understood as being like inauthentic or um, kind of like a fake or like imaginative. But I think actually with an object like this, we see that it's kind of the opposite. Like chinoiserie is used to signify this is real porcelain and it's related to China through these images. Um, audiences were intended to look at this and understand it as Chinese, but better because it was domestic, right? Because it's European, it's, it's Saxon in this case. So these ideas of import su substitution, authenticity, aesthetic equivalency become really important in the 18th century. Um, here we're looking um, at a, a French commode, um, which um, is not a toilet, but is a um, cabinet, uh, meaning it, it's commodious, it's convenient, it's a sort of um, object of convenience. Um, so this is at uh, the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. And um, here we see it's by the a master French cabinet maker, uh, Bernard Ben Reisenberg, and um, he has, um, he's, in many ways kind of collaborating with a lot of different people on this object. He has acquired Japanese black and gold uh, lacquer, um, a screen probably that he cut up and mounts here in the center of this uh, beautiful um, gilded frame. Uh, but those objects are very precious. And you can see he's, he's paying a lot of attention to kind of composition. He needs to find a good part of the screen to cut up in order to make a kind of beautiful composition that will fit into uh, this cabinet. So then he supplements it on either side with the French version of lacquerware um, called in English Japaning. 
um, because it was from Japan, um, and in French, Vernis Matin, or um, Martin Varnish, um, named after the two French brothers who, um, who invented the term. So, um, so uh, this, and this particular material probably actually is by the Martin brothers, so it's like really authentic, Vernis Martin, which was essentially a kind of a, a mixture of paints and resins. So um, they don't have the material in Europe that you need to make true lacquerware, so they emulate it with um, these thick kind of um, gummy paints. But one of the things I think is so interesting, so um, I mean, we could debate which one's prettier, I suppose. Um, and perhaps Reisenberg wanted us to do that, but he seems confident enough in the European uh, imitation of Japanese lacquer to put it right next to real Japanese lacquer. It seems to me that he's asking um, the viewers to, um, any viewer that would have bothered to look at that commode, <laughs> this down kind of below uh, their waist level. Um, he's saying essentially that, that the French is, if not as good, um, or a substitute for true Japanese lacquer, um, it is at least um, a, a beautiful kind of complement to it. So we're seeing again a, a, a French, and in this case Japanese object, uh, to, materials brought together um, in this French form um, to create a kind of um, new kind of cross-cultural object. And it's clear from these very, very expensive luxury pieces of furniture um, that people took the Japanese and Chinese objects that were coming into Europe at this time, they took them very, very seriously. They were precious objects. On the one hand, you might be kind of horrified, like they cut up a Japanese screen. Uh, but this is a much more useful form for a um, French townhouse in the 18th century than a Japanese screen would have been. Um, so in many ways, it's, it's taking that precious material and uh, turning it into a kind of useful luxury object. Oh, there's the detail of it. Sorry, I should have showed you this before. Um, so here you can see, I think, how nicely he's using this kind of um, empty space here in the screen as the moment for um, the escutcheon or um, lock mechanism. And I think you can really see how different the Verne Martin is from um, the Japanese lacquer, um, but put right up next to it and intended to kind of aesthetically respond to it. Okay, so this idea of um, equivalency that the Europeans are um, making something that can go side to side, literally, um, with high quality uh, Chinese and uh, Japanese exports um, gets taken up in, a, in more kind of modest objects as well. So um, this is a plate um, that's actually over at the Palace of the Legion of Honor in the Bose collection, um, made um, by the Bow Factory which was the second porcelain factory in England um, to open in the late 1740s. And in England, um, they had difficulty finding both the materials that were necessary to make true or hard paste porcelain, and um, the, the kiln technology was also difficult for them. So um, they uh, made soft paste porcelain, a kind of imitation um, version of porcelain, which is what we see um, here. Uh, and so we're seeing an object very much kind of inspired by Chinese export wares. It clearly seems like an object intended for uh, a, a, an English factory to uh, try to supplant the market for uh, Chinese uh, porcelain in the mid middle of the 18th century, uh, but very much uh, borrowing from its uh, Buddhist motifs and this kind of um, imaginative Chinese scene in the center. But the scene is so fantastic. Um, please go over um, to the museum and, uh, and look at this object because it's a, it's a wonderful um, thing that you see here with um, a decorator at Bow having a little fun here. So you have these um, two sort of uh, what the British understood to be sort of Chinese figures holding a parasol um, set within a kind of generic Chinese landscape. And they're looking at and discussing this 
um, lidded jar on a pedestal that, I'm sorry, uh, it's so small that this is the best detail I can get of it, but it says underneath the jar, bow. <laughs> So no English porcelain was sent to China in this period. <laughs> this is um, not an uh, example of uh, the Chinese admiring um, European uh, porcelain, which uh, is kind of hard to imagine they would. Um, but, uh, but here, Bo imagining itself to be so equivalent to Chinese wares as to be admired by Chinese audiences themselves, right? or at least saying they are. It's a great piece of advertising. Okay. Um, so we see kind of um, the, the market for bow would have been relatively what we would call middle class. Um, it was not particularly expensive wares and um, well, um, quite beautiful in some ways, was not the kind of like high style chinoiserie that we see adopted by the European aristocracy. Um, nearly every European palace um, in Europe by the 18th century had at least one Chinese room. And I think the Habsburg em emperors and empress in um, Vienna did some of the most interesting things with it. So here um, we're seeing um, the so-called old lacquer room at the Schönbrunn Palace in um, uh, Vienna, uh, decorated um, by uh, Peter the Great and then um, uh, Empress Maria Theresa. And um, we see here um, portraits of um, the Habsburg rulers set into this magnificent French style boiserie or um, wood paneled decoration which again, like the Reisenberg commode that we just looked at, took both Japanese um, black and gold screens, um, cut them up and set them into panels, and then flanked them, I'm sorry, this isn't such a great photo of it, but flanked them with Viennese um, examples of Verni Martin or Japaning. So we have, again, um, Chinese, or excuse me, Japanese um, screens uh, below or on top of and next to uh, Viennese lacquerware. And then in another um, less discussed room um, in that house, we have the Millionzimmer, um, where we see members of the Habsburg imperial family doing a kind of crafting project. <laughs> um, so here we see um, that somehow uh, by the middle of the 18th century, um, Maria Theresa and um, her children, um, including um, the uh, soon to be Marie Antoinette of France, uh, were, um, got their hands on some, a lot of Mughal miniature paintings and um, were captivated by them, interested in them, and decided to do something with them. Um, so they cut them up and collaged them into these kind of fantastic scenes that they then mounted or had mounted for them, surely, um, in um, gilding and um, mahogany boiserie um, in this room. So here's uh, one that's been taken out for conservation so you can see what they looked like outside the frame. Here's a detail of uh, just one of them. And you can see, so they're taking um, compositions so here's one cut, uh, and then piecing it together with another um, object quite skillfully, right? Um, so creating these kind of interior and um, outdoor scenes. I think engaging with the kind of um, flat perspective uh, that was characteristic of these paintings and uh, kind of um, combining it in kind of interesting ways. The fact that Mughal um, paintings often have kind of layered flat profile figures made it really ideal for collage where you can just cut out a figure and paste it onto um, a background, which uh, we see elsewhere as well. Um, so again, feel free to be offended if you want to. Cutting up these incredibly beautiful um, paintings is an act of destruction, but it's an act of creative, it's, it's a creative destruction, right? It creates um, something um, that um, seemed more um, appropriate, more um, relevant, more kind of captivating for this royal audience. 
And we see this over and over again in Europe, this kind of creative destruction and engagement with um, Chinese and sometimes Japanese um, visual and material culture. Um, in England, um, in the beautiful so-called Chinese drawing room at Temple Newsom in Leeds. You can go there today and visit, and this is what you'll see. Um, Lady Hartford was given um, 36 rolls of hand-painted Chinese wallpaper um, by her um, friend, possibly lover, um, George, the, uh, George IV, the Prince Regent at the time. She did nothing with it when it was given to her in the early 19th century. But sometime in the 1820s or even uh, possibly 1830s, um, she was inspired to paper this room uh, with that wallpaper, um, but found it, uh, for some reason, not quite enough. So here I'm going to show you a detail, that, which is this. She also had a first edition of John James Audubon's Birds of America. And um, she decided that those birds would look simply smashing um, on the wallpaper. So she cut up um, her uh, edition <laughs> of Audubon's Birds of America. This is the plate of the Columbia J that she had. And she pasted them on her wall. <laughs> Audubon apparently was so horrified, he immediately canceled her subscription. <laughs> so he was offended. Right? Uh, but it creates, um, you can agree with me or not, um, I think um, she does it in this really kind of skillful way, right? This is not like children's like collage project, right? Like this is someone who's looking really carefully um, at composition and how to embed other types of objects in it. Um, and so this was a kind of um, obviously privileged and often um, kind of female amateur artistic practice, this engagement particularly with um, print um, and um, 2D materials to um, cut them up um, and collage them into kind of new creations, a sort of very elite version of crafting, right? And then we see um, a professional um, decorators doing this as well, another kind of example of um, the creative destruction of objects, um, of course, with um, bronze-mounted porcelain that we see a lot of in France. So in France, um, we have a lot of consumers who were um, really very enthusiastic collectors of high quality Chinese and particularly Japanese porcelain. Japanese porcelain was much rarer in um, Europe, so it was uh, much more highly um, valued. And one way to express one's admiration um, and interest in these materials was to reinterpret them. Um, so here, um, another pair of lidded jars, um, also at the Getty, um, that um, have been cut down and mounted with um, French porcelain uh, mounts. Um, in the Rococo style in this really kind of beautiful way. And these are such clever objects. So um, they're um, functional as uh, lidded jars. The, the, the lids actually come off. Um, and you see um, they're beautifully handled, so in some ways um, it makes them uh, more kind of useful. They, I'm not saying these were actually ever used for any purpose, but they could be moved around. Um, the mounts give them a tremendous kind of um, sculptural presence within an exuberant decorative interior. And then on the top you see all this, um, there's a crayfish and um, kind of sea life, shells and um, coral here, kind of playing on this earlier association of porcelain with shells. Um, so the word porcelain comes from uh, the Portuguese, porcela, uh, which is a shell um, before porcelain, uh, the actual recipe for porcelain was discovered in the early 18th century. Um, There's a widespread belief in Europe that porcelain was made of ground up shells, which somehow had been like reconstituted into <laughs> these kind of fabulous objects. Um, so the kind of association with um, shell work, as well as I think a kind of broader association that porcelain had between um, kind of raw earth, right? That it's a natural material, it's clay. 
fashioned into art through skill and technology. It seems to me that the, that the mounts in many ways kind of highlight that idea of a transmutation that occurred um, from clay to porcelain, from liquid metal into these kind of vibrant and um, organic kind of exuberant um, shapes. It's seen, uh, they're kind of, um, objects that have kind of, a, or materials that have an affinity to one another. So we see here, um, yes, they cut the jars, um, but they do so um, for um, both a kind of a dramatic aesthetic effect, but I think also, um, you know, if we want to interpret them, what do they mean? Um, we can also see uh, that there's this kind of deeper sort of engagement with the materials, what they were, what they became, um, and uh, kind of the process of uh, skilled creativity that's on display with them. So this idea of um, a kind of creative um, destruction, engagement, recreation of objects um, also seem very much bound up with kind of social political authority um, in the 18th century, um, particularly um, in uh, Europe, but elsewhere we'll see as well. Um, so here I'm showing you um, a Bouvet tapestry series, it's French tapestry um, called the, um, the um, Emperor uh, uh, the story of the Emperor of China series um, designed in the late 17th century and woven um, at Bouvet um, over a long period of time in the uh, early 18th century. Um, so this uh, tapestry series originally hung um, at um, Fontainebleau, uh, French royal palace, and um, it shows, uh, again, this kind of um, wild sort of chinoiserie interpretation of um, what was understood to be kind of Chinese political culture. So here we see uh, the so-called emperor of China uh, enthroned on a cushion and receiving the kowtow. Um, so this idea of uh, the kind of full prostrate bow um, was something um, that seemed to be a kind of an anathema um, to um, European courtiers, um, and so was a kind of object of fascination um, to them, and seemed to really kind of, uh, to uh, a royal patron seemed to kind of confer this idea of like, absolute kind of political authority, which was very appealing to um, the Bourbon monarchs in France at this time who operated under an absolutist political system. Um, so here um, you see a French ruler kind of imagining or looking at an, an image that imagines you have absolute political authority. It's great, right? Like none of those kind of dueling courtiers and, and um, kind of vicious court culture, um, but this um, scene of kind of prosperity, peace, opulence, and a regulated pol political culture. So, um, the kind of imagination of uh, China in France as being a kind of ideal absolutist culture, um, we see in a lot of French chinoiserie of the period. And uh, indeed, we see um, Chinese images being uh, kind of repeatedly used to signify a kind of um, triumph of political authority. In Britain, I'm sorry, I didn't bring a picture of it, but in Britain we see um, uh, after a lot of military battles throughout the 18th century and then in through the 19th century as well, um, often to celebrate the, the victory of a war, they would erect a pagoda, um, like in Hyde Park or something, and set off fireworks from it um, as a kind of celebratory, kind of triumphal um, kind of um, image of uh, political um, triumph. But curiously, we also see that kind of the opposite happening in China, right? So some of you are probably familiar with this image. Um, it's uh, Yi Lan Tai's um, engraving, one of uh, his engravings of um, a European building at Yuanmin Mong, um, the uh, Qing uh, Dynasty uh, Palace. 
north of Beijing, uh, where uh, through the middle of the 18th century, uh, Jesuit architects and painters assisted um, Chinese builders in creating a series of um, European style pavilions within uh, the Chinese garden. Um, so here um, are some of, uh, one engraving, this is the um, Hall of Calm Seas, I believe, the, yeah, uh, the Hall of Calm Seas, where you see um, a, uh, uh, sculptures representing the zodiac, um, a kind of Rococo shell-like fountain, and this kind of grand Baroque Rococo uh, tile roofed <laughs> sort of Chinese um, building. Um, I think, again, kind of representing um, a sense of sort of imperial triumph, right? So here you have the Chinese, the Qianlong Emperor, um, using European chinoiserie to, again, represent that idea of kind of political authority um, and a kind of a reference to um, a, perhaps a, a a mastery over other parts of the world and, and a kind of comfort, a comfort and association um, with that world. So um, the sense of political authority went really in both directions. But um, some of you may say, I came for the Japanese mask. So um, let's kind of switch over to that area. So um, really what we're seeing um, in Japan, and something that's been very interesting to me that, um, that I've been working on and um, reading about um, is uh, the relationship uh, between Japan and the rest of the world in this period. I think um, traditionally I was always taught you know, that Japan was very closed in the 18th century, no contact, right? Um, but um, recent scholarship by people like Tim and Screech and others um, have um, been really uh, trying to interrogate this idea. And one of the most obvious places you can do that is with woodblock prints. So um, here I'm showing you um, excuse me, let me find my notes. We're in the right place. Okay. Um, it is uh, Masanobu's, um, one of his uh, so called perspective works, an uh, uh, image um, in the Yoshiwara district in um, Edo um, at the time. And you can see so clearly um, that he's um, engaging with. Western single point perspective, right? So um, he's looking at um, images that are coming in mainly from Dutch traders, uh, which uh, were circulating in Japan uh, at this time. Uh, very likely as well that these types of prints could have come from um, China and through Korea to Japan as well. So we can see that Masanobu is engaging um, with the European Renaissance idea of organizing pictorial space um, on a two-dimensional surface so as to appear three-dimensional um, with these um, orthogonal lines uh, meeting at a vanishing point. Um, so the so-called ukiyo-e um, images, images of the floating world, which referred, of course, to the subject matter and the pleasure districts of uh, the Yoshiwara and this idea of a kind of floating world um, as a pleasure place. We also see it, um, I think, referencing perspective and the idea of a, a floating world um, or a, a place organized according to a kind of a Western pictorial logic. And we see this really interesting engagement, particularly in Japanese prints, um, with uh, European perspective, uh, but also sometimes with European um, imagery. So um, here we're looking at Utagara. Utagawa Toyoharu's um, The Bell That Rings for 10,000 Leagues in the Dutch Port of Frankai, or Venice. <laughs> right. So um, here we're looking at uh, uh, the, the Grand Canal in Venice, um, reinterpreted um, by um, this uh, Japanese artist um, who uh, had uh, obviously kind of a limited either understanding or interest in European geography and what the difference between Venice and Holland might have been. Um, and um, imagines instead um, gondolas and um, small figures 
Um, he's clearly looking at Italian prints, possibly even kind of grand tour images like Canaletto's, uh, uh, kind of souvenir images of uh, Venice and um, re or interpreting it according to, uh, to a certain extent, to uh, along the lines of single point perspective, um, but also with um, something besides just the writing on the side um, that seems more characteristic of um, uh, Japanese prints and their treatment of space. Excuse me. I'm just going to go back for a moment. Um, so um, this. Um, engagement with European pictorial traditions and uh, European objects in Japan, sometimes referred to as rangaku or um, Dutch studies. Um, and um, so um, we, we see this as one somewhat kind of unacknowledged aspect of the development of um, one of the most celebrated aspects of uh, Japanese uh, visual culture of the period, um, the, the ukiyo-e print. Which, of course, then we're much more familiar with the way in which those prints strongly influenced um, European culture as well. So here I'm showing you um, the American artist working in um, Britain, James McNeil Whistler's Caprice in Purple and Gold, the Golden Screen um, from 1864, where we see a kind of image in sort of full-blown Japonisma, um, the European enthusiasm um, for Japanese material and visual culture. So, um, of course, in 1853, the American naval commander, um, Commodore Perry, um, engages in gunboat go gunboat diplomacy and opens Japan um, to Western trade. And um, within the decade, we see a kind of flood of um, Japanese um, images and objects um, flooding into um, European and American markets. And this is a moment when we also see the European engagement with China as being fraught. It's right in between the two opium wars, um, increasingly um, disagreements over trade um, and uh, missionary work are uh, creating a, um, a hostile political uh, and diplomatic relationship between Europe and China. And so Japan kind of offers at this moment, I think for a lot of European and American um, viewers, a kind of um, seemingly like politics free kind of engagement um, with um, Asian visual material culture. It also um, is obviously uh, very distinct from Chinese um, imagery um, and therefore um, provided a, a new and kind of um, exciting um, mode of engagement. So um, we see here she's um, dressed in um, some form of a kimono. She has a gold screen um, behind her, blue and white porcelain jar in the lower <laughs> foreground, and then uh, prints all around her. So in many ways, um, Whistler and um, images like by William Merritt Chase and a number of um, other artists who imagined um, uh, these um, scenes of uh, women and their engagement with uh, Japanese art. Um, we're following, I think, in the tradition of chinoiserie, of um, associating it particularly um, with um, kind of uh, female viewers, uh, people like Lady Hartford, who cut up Audubon's um, birds and stuck them um, on um, her wallpaper. This, uh, the fashion for chinoiserie, uh, at least rhetorically, if not in practice, was kind of feminized. And, and you see a similar kind of feminization of the, um, the interest um, in Japonisme, exemplified by um, Whistler, uh, Whistler's women. And um, we see, I think, one of the most kind of um, serious um, engagements with um, uh, Japanese uh, material culture, particularly woodblock prints, with uh, the female artist, in another American, this time working in France, Mary Cassatt. Um, so um, as you all know, I think there was an exhibition recently at the Asian Art Museum that, that traced this relationship between uh, the, the Impressionists and uh, uh, 
Japanese woodblock prints at the time, so um, a lot of this will be uh, familiar uh, to you. Looking at Japanese woodblock prints, like uh, Kiyonaga's interior of a bathhouse, um, this particular print is now at the MFA Boston um, and was a uh, formerly owned by Cassatt's friend and fellow painter, uh, Edward Degas. Um, so these types of images were um, uh, collected enthusiastically and studied carefully by the French Impressionists like Degas and Cassatt. Um, and on the one hand, um, we could look at other uh, fellow artists like Vincent van Gogh, and there's this um, uh, sometimes a very kind of superficial kind of appropriation of just trying to look something that's sort of, like make something that just sort of looks Japanese in some way. Um, so that's one aspect of Japonisma. But I also think we, like in Cassatt's work, we see her looking really seriously and trying to understand um, this um, perspectival mode where you have this kind of foreshortening and um, this kind of flattened image of an interior space. Uh, the delineation of figures through kind of bold graphic lines that you can see Cassatt emulating here, um, that kind of um, interest in graphic patterned blocks set right against um, kind of um, matted, emptier spaces. We see uh, Cassatt engaging with that as well. And then the kind of contrast of patterns where you have the carpet, the uh, dress, and um, the jar, all kind of offering um, different kind of visual patterns that somehow uh, work together uh, next to one another. And then, of course, the subject matter as well. The bathhouse, the kind of genre scene that's sort of erotic, but it's also um, sort of everyday. I think Cassatt um, interprets that very nicely um, in the, this uh, particular work, La Toilette. Um, so here I think we're seeing, again, another kind of creative engagement, in this case not an act of destruction, but um, using the experience of uh, viewing Asian art to create something new um, that's distinctly European, um, but connected to um, a serious visual aesthetic engagement uh, with, um, in this case, uh, Japanese objects, um, but was also the case for uh, Chinese objects. So, um, this proliferation of materials, I think, um, is, it's coming in through um, trade and is being disseminated through commercial galleries and shops, department stores like Liberty in London were selling Japanese objects uh, by the 1860s and 70s. Um, here in the upper right-hand corner, um, we have the, uh, the Japanese uh, and Chinese pavilions at the Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1867, and here um, Japanese objects displayed at the International Exhibition in London in 1862. Uh, so the, um, like really, like very quickly after um, Japan is uh, forced open to trade, we see a lot of um, objects coming to Europe and a lot of different audiences engaging with them. So it wasn't just artists, but it was also um, uh, middle class uh, people who um, had access to these objects through international exhibitions, department stores, and um, things like that. And so again, we see a kind of um, creative engagement with them. So here I'm showing you um, the British artist E.W. Godwin's uh, sideboard. There's a number of copies of it, um, but this one is at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And you can see that Godwin is looking at um, small Japanese objects, and I think trying to imagine them in relationship to kind of large furniture pieces. So for the most part, we don't see large furniture being um, exported from Japan um, to um, Europe. Um, so here we see Godwin, I think, kind of engaging um, with uh, 
um, certain aesthetic principles, a kind of focus on horizontality, um, revealing the methods of construction. He's clearly looked at Japanese architecture and is trying to uh, understand something of um, its um, post and lintel structure. And then, um, they're not coming through very clearly in this slide, but then he has uh, these embossed leather um, decorations that are covered in kind of silver mica dust. Um, here, little kind of um, references to kind of Japanese patterning um, and screens embedded into the piece. So they're, they're leather, um, but he's kind of uh, referencing the idea of a screen. And so um, Godwin is uh, developing this in the context of Japanese, but, but also the context of design reform of the 1850s, where we see uh, British um, designers, architects, painters, um, looking at British manufactured goods, um, such as those were, that were on display in international exhibitions, and then looking at Japanese and particularly Indian goods as well, and, and really seeing uh, the Victorian style is kind of coming up short, right? And so there's this question of, you know, how can we be a colonial power? Um, we are Britain, we are, uh, uh, you know, colonial authority at this point, but, but the um, so-called, the people who seem to be in need of our salvation, right, our uh, Christian missionary work, seem to have a more sophisticated, um, decorative, and um, artistic visual language than the British, particularly when it came to useful objects. So the movement of design reform was really uh, very much inspired by looking at particularly Indian and Japanese objects and trying to learn their so-called universal principles that then could be applied to British design and manufacture. Um, so um, the... Um, Relative. I wouldn't. I wouldn't call this a simple piece at all. But the the way in which um, it pairs back ornament uh, reduces um, the um, surface decoration, and in many ways, kind of reveals the methods of its construction. Uh, were um, things that Godwin saw in Japanese art uh, and architecture and found admirable. And here we see him interpreting it into a kind of modern British example, something that, that he put forward um, under the terms of kind of good modern design. So um, the, it, but in, by the middle of the 19th century, we see a kind of a growing movement towards what we would call modernism in art and design. And um, the Impressionists are looking at prints and, try and um, adopting something of its abstract visual language. And then we see designers like Godwin looking at um, decorative objects and architecture and uh, trying to adapt some of uh, the aesthetic principles they see there and apply them to design. And I think um, this is my final slide. I'm sorry I'm ending a little bit early, but maybe there'll be plenty of time for discussion and questions then. Uh, but um, we then see that, uh, that, as I said, chinoiserie and Japanese, they never really go out of um, fashion. Here I'm showing you an example, a modern photo from um, Architectural Digest magazine of um, de Gournay wallpaper, um, hand-painted Chinese wallpaper that you can go, I think they even have a shop in San Francisco, right? Um, you can um, go and buy um, very dearly, I'm sure, um, this uh, wallpaper um, that is very much a kind of um, continuation of this 18th century um, chinoiserie style. Um, interpreted for a, um, certainly not modernist, but uh, modern interior. So um, the kind of lure of these images, I think, continues today um, in ways that, um, that I think can be um, quite kind of creative, productive, and modern. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>